Good afternoon, Houston scholars. My name is Linda Bessmer and I'm with Muses 3. Before we begin our read aloud this afternoon of Island Boy, I'd like to just cover a few quick things with you. I know that you've all heard a lot about stopping the spread of the virus. And in fact, our own Governor Abbott this afternoon encouraged everyone, especially those of us that live in the greater Houston area, to follow the guidelines. I want to go over those guidelines with you very quickly and just encourage you to realize that you can help no matter how big or small you are, no matter how old or young you are, we can all help stop the spread of the virus. The first thing we all need to do is wash our hands with soap and water. Well, how long do you need to wash your hands? I heard a doctor say about 20 seconds, and then he added, 20 seconds is how long it would take you to sing happy birthday to yourself two times. So again, remember to wash your hands with soap and water for about 20 seconds. The second thing that we can do is to cover coughs or sneezes with a tissue. If you can't reach a tissue, cough into your elbow. If you do use a tissue to cough, to cover a cough or sneeze, you should throw it away immediately and then wash your hands for 20 seconds. The third thing we all need to do is not touch our face with our fingers or our hands. And it's very hard when you have an itch, but again, if you um, would reach for a tissue and use the tissue to itch your face, you can help stop the spread of the virus. The last thing that we're being encouraged to do, you might have heard the term social distancing. And all that means is that you need to keep um, about um, uh, six feet between yourself and anyone outside of your immediate household, anyone that doesn't live with you. So if you see a neighbor or a friend, you need to stay about six feet away from that person so that if they should cough or sneeze or you should cough or sneeze, the virus can't reach the other person. So again, these are all things that we can do to help. If you are watching the video production of Island Boy, our read aloud, you can ask questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If you click on that button, you can then type in your question or ask an older sibling or adult in your household to type the question in for you. And I will then make sure that Miss Cindy sees those questions and we answer them. And now I'm very pleased to turn the camera and the mic over to Cindy Bessmer. And yes, she is my sister. Um, she is the Assistant Director of HR Services at Bowdoin College all the way up in Maine. And the book is being read with the permission of Puffin Books, which is a division of Penguin Publishing Group. Miss Cindy, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn the audio and the video over to you. Thanks, Linda, I really appreciate it. Hello, young readers. Um, today I'm going to share a book called Island Boy. And I hope you can see the cover of it there. It was written and also illustrated by Barbara Cooney. And Barbara Cooney was a person who absolutely loved Maine. I have a picture of her here. I hope that you'll be able to see this a little bit. This is a picture of her out in her boat. Um, and she loved Maine. She lived in Damariscotta, Maine, which is on the coast. And she loved to write about people and places and things that happened around here in our state. So Island Boy, I wanted to ask first of all, is do all of you know what an island is? An island is a body or a chunk of land that has water all the way around it. And sometimes there's a bridge to an island and sometimes you have to get there by boat. And in the story Island Boy, um, you had to get there by boat. So here we go, Island Boy by Barbara Cooney.
I'm going to show you the pictures first, then read the text on the page and then show the pictures again. And I'll try to remember to do that each page as I go. At first, there was just the island. It sat by itself, the outermost island, crowned with spiky spruce trees facing the sea. Behind it, in the bay, lay the other islands, and behind them, the mainland and Green Harbor, where the family came from. It was Pa who felled the trees and cleared the north end of the island, and it was he who dug the well now full of sweet water. It was he who cut the stone and the wood to make the house. And when all was ready, he brought his wife, the three children and the family cow to live on the island. And henceforth, it would be known as Tibbet's Island for this was the family name. And in this picture, they're just arriving at the island. You can see one of the daughters is bringing the cow in <laughs> and there's just the one house. Time passed. Now there were six boys and six girls, 12 children in all. And from a beam in the loft hung an old sail, dividing the room in two. And in the soft salt air wafting up from the cove, they slept, the girls on one side and the boys on the other. All that is except Matice, the little clear-eyed quiet one the baby. He slept in a trundle bed downstairs next to his mother and father. In this picture, you can see that the children are having a pillow fight. I was wondering if you had ever had a pillow fight with your brothers or sisters or with friends or cousins. And over here in this tiny little picture on this side, you see Matthijs is asleep in his trundle bed a trundle bed is a little low bed that can be fit underneath a tall bed. And I wondered if you had ever slept in one of those. I know Miss Linda and I have slept in a trundle bed ourselves. Pa taught the boys to plow and to plant, to fell a tree and to build a stone wall. He taught them to cut ice and stone and to hunt and to fish. And he taught them how to handle a boat, which is very important when you live on an island. Pa and the boys cleared more land, making room for potatoes and beans, for squash and corn cabbages and onions. They built a shelter for their 30 sheep and a barn for the six cows and the two oxen, star and bright. They built a chicken house, a sty for the two pigs and a fish house down by the cove. Matthias tagged along, always watching, always underfoot. Go play somewhere, said his big noisy brothers, you're too small to help. I am not, said Matthijs. So he went to help the girls collect eggs. And later, while they were milking, he sat under the red astrakhan apple tree that Ma had planted above the house. And he thought about his smallness, but he did not stay small forever. And again, in this picture, you can see how Pa has built the pigsty and the barn. And all the children seem to be out there working and doing chores. Do you do chores around your house? 
And over in the corner under the apple tree, you see little Matthias who's thinking about his smallness, but he won't be small long. I like this picture. Soon, he was old enough to read. And when the house had been banked with spruce boughs and the firewood cut for the winter, the bitter cold came. Matthias would wake up with the tip of his nose like ice. The window panes frosted over and the wind whistled in the chimney. Sea smoke hung near the open water. Then the children would crowd into the steamy kitchen learning to read and write under Ma's fierce eye. And when they could bear the indoors no longer, they hung around the barn, helping Pa with the animals. And when the snow crested over, they climbed the hill and slid down from the red astrakhan tree to the fish house. You could use a barrel stave, said Ma, but the children preferred the seat of their pants. So this actually are two different pictures here. Here's the ma in the kitchen teaching reading and writing. Maybe you're doing your learning in your kitchen right now. The children are using slates and chalk. You probably have pencils, papers, and maybe even computers. And in this picture, you can see the children are sliding down the big hill on the seats of their pants. And there's a little birdie over in that corner. As Matthias grew older, he worked side by side with his brothers, plowing and planting and chopping wood. And soon he began to go fishing with Pa. One sparkling morning, the two set off. The egg rock, which was far to the west, was shining in the early light. What a handsome day it is, said Pa. Let's go get your Ma some eggs and the hens ain't laying. So despite a good breeze, there was almost no swell and Pa could pull right in tight alongside the rock. I'll hold the boat here, he said, catching on to the rock with his gaff. Get going, Matthias, and fill the basket with eggs. Matthias scrambled up among the gulls and the terns, the cormorants, the eiders and the sea pigeons. On the rock were many eggs and broken shells, and among them lay a small ball of gray brown fluff, a baby seagull. An orphan, said Matthias, tucking the little bird into the basket. So again, here he is on Eastern Egg Rock. And there's a little baby seagull in the corner of the page. You can't tame a wild bird, said Ma. I forgot to show you this picture. Let me go back here. Sorry. You can't tame a wild bird, said Ma, but Matthias did. He dug clams and he gathered mussels for the little gull. The bird ate everything, even pie and donuts. His pin feathers sprouted and then his real feathers came and pretty soon he was full grown. Over and over again, Matthias threw the bird up into the air, teaching him how to fly but the gull preferred to hop. So Matthijs called him Toad. 
Wherever Matthijs went, Toad went. He watched Matthijs split kindling. He squatted in the grass, his neck thrust out, plowing Matthijs' every move as he hoed the potatoes. He hopped and flopped behind Matthijs down to the little cobble beach where they picked up lobsters at low tide. When Matthijs and Dipa went fishing, Toad crouched seasick in the bottom of the dory. He'd be happier flying, said Pa. Yes, said Matthijs dismally. And then, one foggy day, out near the egg rock, the gulls called to Toad, and Toad understood. And he spread his wings and gave a hop or two, and then, in a wavery way, he was aloft going home. How many of you have pets at home? How many of you have pets that do everything with you right side by side? We have a pet that does here at my house. One by one, the Tibbetts children grew up and left the island. The girls to marry and the boys to work in the shipyard of Uncle Albion, who was Pa's brother in Green Harbor. Only Matthijs was left with Ma and Pa on Tibbetts Island. You are too young to leave home, said the brothers. You're still wet behind the ears. But Matthijs, who wondered what lay beyond Tibbetts Island, didn't listen. And indeed, his turn to leave came sooner than anyone expected. In Green Harbor, Uncle Albion was building a handsome schooner. When it was finished, everyone from the islands and from the neighboring villages came to the launching. The ship was named the Six Brothers. And when she sailed, Matthijs went along as the cabin boy. As you can see in this picture, a schooner is a big, big sailing ship, and this one carried cargo. If you owned a schooner, what would you name it? Miss Linda and I might name ours three brothers. <laughs> we had three brothers. In every weather, Matthijs sailed on the ship, the six brothers up and down the coast from Green Harbor to Portland. He sailed to Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, even to the West Indies. The ship carried cobblestones gathered on the shores of the outermost islands, round, smooth stones to pave the city streets and hay for the many horses that trotted up and down on those streets. The six brothers carried bricks from the brickyards along the tidal rivers for the elegant townhouses. And it carried heron and eider and gull feathers to adorn the bonnets of the ladies who lived in those houses. After 15 years, Matthijs, so steady and so clear-eyed, had become master of the Six Brothers and the pride of everyone in Green Harbor and around the Bay. But despite the bustle and the wonders of the cities, Matthijs could not forget the island. And whenever the Six Brothers entered the Bay on a return voyage, when the Egg Rock came into view and beyond it, Tibbetts Island, Matthijs' heart always skipped a beat. 
One day, Matthias told himself, I will return home. And this he did. So there's his little sailing chip up there. And he's going to leave all of the excitement of the city behind him. On Matthias' last return voyage, the six brothers carried a young schoolmistress from Boston coming to teach in Graniteville. Her name was Hannah. No feathers on her bonnet, said Matthias approvingly. Ma and Pa, having removed to the mainland, the house on Tibbetts Island was empty. But the island was still home to Matthias. He used all of the skills that Pa had taught him. He repaired the roof of the house. He jacked up the barn and the sheds. He plowed a patch for potatoes and corn. And in June, he sailed up to Graniteville where he married the school teacher, Hannah, and brought her home to the island. Three little girls were born to Hannah and Matthias. Ellie and Nellie, the twins, and little Annie. A farmer needs some sons for heavy work, his brothers told him. You'd be better off if you had, if you were living on the mainland. No, said Matthias, we belong here. And women and girls can work mighty hard too, said Hannah. From June, when the scent of wild strawberries filled the air, until late summer, when the last of the raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries were gone, the girls went berrying. In the fall, they gathered cranberries in the bog back of the sea beach. And then Hannah and the girls made jams and jellies and pies as well from the apples of the red astrakhan tree. Hannah taught the girls how to make butter and cheese, and soap and candles and bread and Indian pudding and a good chowder. They learned to spin and weave, to knit and sew. At least Ellie and Nellie did. But little Annie, she could not sit still indoors. She collected crabs and trotted behind Matthijs when he wasn't off fishing. My little wild bird, Matthijs called her. She could whistle like one too. Time passed. The little girls grew up and went away. Even little Annie with her flyaway hair settled down and married a sailmaker. Matthijs and Hannah remained on the island. Matthijs called little Annie, his little wild bird. Do you have a nickname that someone in your family uses for you? When I was reading this page, it makes me think that Annie is very much like her dad, Matthijs, when he was a little boy. At about this time, people from away, from Boston and Philadelphia, discovered the beautiful bay. They bought up the land near the water 
and they built large houses that they called cottages. And along their docks, they moored their pleasure boats and they called themselves rusticators. Kind of like vacationers and tourists all mixed up together, rusticators. You could sell the island to the people from away, said Hannah. But our wants are so few now, said Matisse, and this is home. One winter at the end of February, Hannah died and Matisse was alone. He remembered her words about selling the island to the people from away, but no, he would not. He need not do that. Besides, now there was another little Matisse to think of. Every summer, Annie sent her son, little Matisse, out to the island. And all day he followed his grandfather about. And at night he slept in the trundle bed, wrapped in the sweet air of the sea and the meadows. He wanted to stay on the island forever. So there's the big cottages of the rusticators. And over on this page, you can see little Matthias following his grandpa in the title flat. He wanted to stay on the island forever. Do you have a place where you'd like to stay forever? It was a cold, hard winter, the year that little Matisse was five. The snow lay deep for months, and many people in Green Harbor died of the influenza. One was little Matthias's pa. So that spring, Annie and little Matisse went out to live on the island for good. In May, Matisse planted a much too big vegetable garden and he had seven cows brought to the island. But we are just three people, said Annie. Oh, well, the people from away, the summer people, are going to need vegetables, said Matisse, and milk for their children, too. And Annie remembered all of the things Hannah had tried to teach her. Jellies and jams, she said, and they will need their laundry washed and starched and ironed and for a while, anyway, they were not going to sell Tibbets Island. So every day all summer, Matisse and little Matisse loaded up the dory with cans of milk, with vegetables from their garden, eggs and butter, with jams and jellies and hampers heaped with snowy linen, and they set off across the bay toward the mainland. In September, the people from away boarded up their houses and they returned to the cities where the fathers worked and the children went to school. On the island during the long winter evenings, Matthias and his grandson sat by the stove and played checkers and fox and geese. Sometimes Matthias told about life on Tibbets Island when he was growing up and sometime he told wondrous tales about sailing on the six brothers and about life in the big cities. I too shall be a sea captain when I grow up, said little Matisse, and then I will come back and live on Tibbets Island. Well, it's good to see the world beyond the bay, agreed old Matisse, and then you will know where your heart lies. I already know, said little Matisse. Well, better to wait and see, said his grandfather.
I like this picture because I think it's the same kitchen where Ma taught the grandfather when he was a little boy how to read and write. And you can see they're playing checkers. I wonder if any of our young scholars out there know how to play checkers or even chess. For a long time, life continued in this peaceful way. And then one morning, late in August, old Matisse and young Matisse loaded up a dory for a trip to the mainland. The weather was lowery and the wind in the southeast. It's going to blow. You keep home today, said old Matisse to his grandson. Reluctantly, young Matisse went back up the hill to the house. Old Matisse did not come home that day. They never saw him alive again. And later they found the dory swamped and Matisse nearby. The ocean looks pretty mean in that picture. The waves look really tall. In other pictures of the ocean in the book, Barbara Cooney showed the ocean blue, and in this picture, it's kind of green and gray. Boatloads of people in dark clothing came from all over to the funeral sisters and brothers, nieces and nephews, boat builders, storekeepers, and the men who had sailed and fished with old Matisse, saltwater farmers from the other islands in the mainland, and even people from away. They came in boats of all sizes, hurrying before the northwest wind to come to rest in the sheltered cove on Tibbetts Island. The people climbed the hill and crowded into the little farmhouse to pay their respects to the steadfast old man of Tibbetts Island. A good man, young Matisse heard them say, a good life. And on that handsome day, they buried old Matisse under the red astrakhan tree above the house. And that is the end of the story. This story took place over a hundred years ago, but some things on an island don't change. We still have water all around us. People come by boats and sometimes by the bridge. We still have rusticators who have their cottages here on the coast of Maine. And it's good to know how to sail a boat and plant a garden and relax under an apple tree. Thank you for letting me share this book with you today. Um, I really love the book for a couple of reasons. One is that I had the opportunity to meet Barbara Cooney, um, the person who wrote the story and illustrated the pictures. And actually my book is signed by her and I'd like to show you that page. And it says, for Cindy, Barbara Cooney, 1989. Um, Miss Cooney was very, very talented. Um, because she drew all the pictures and illustrations from the book, it took her a long while to do that. And I got to see some of the original sketches that she made um, for this book and for other books that she had written when they were on display at the place where I work, Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine. So I feel really lucky about that. And as I said, I might have said earlier is that I live on an island and my husband grew up on this island. Um, and he did have the opportunity to travel away 
but then he decided to come back just like Matthias did. He had two children, not 12, just two. Um, and our children grew up on this island and now they are raising their families, um, not here on this island, but on two neighboring islands around us. So right now we have five grandchildren. I'm sorry, we have five island boys and two island girls, seven grandchildren. So thanks for allowing me to uh, share Island Boy with you today. Well, thank you so much, Miss Cindy. We really enjoyed the book. And I'm going to just um, show my screen for one um, uh, brief moment. If you enjoyed this read aloud and you'd like to register to see or hear other read alouds, you can go to http colon slash slash, those are forward slashes, muses3.com forward slash index dot php forward slash read alouds forward slash. And that is the Muses 3 website. That's the page that has all of the read alouds where you can register. At the bottom of the registration links, is where we're going to post both the video and audio files or recordings from each of our read aloud sessions. So if you would like to see this read aloud again, or um, you don't have a tablet or a computer and want to listen to the read aloud, the recording will be at the bottom of that page. I want to thank you again, Miss Cindy, for um, your time today and for sharing one of your favorite books with us. It was my pleasure. Thanks, Linda. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.